to Zaveriak. Okay, so we have a um, we have a Chinese Variac. It's an older one. They look a little slicker than the newer ones that just have a simpler paint job. But most of them are pretty much the same. This is a 10 amp one. Uh huh. Uh, now, what is a Variac? A Variac is an auto transformer. It's basically the primary transformer with a variable tap. Okay. So we have the primary of the transformer sitting across the AC line, which is 120 volts. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have a variable tap, which is on a rotor that actually just slides over the windings of the primary. Oh. And it just picks the voltage off at various points across the primary from the bottom to the top. Okay. So it's a real crude device. Mm -hmm. It's just a coil of wire wrapped around an insulator. Mm -hmm. And then it has a contact that where all the wire on the top of the insulator is bare. So the contact can touch each, each turn of wire and then it just picks off the voltage at any point there. That totally makes so sense. So all we need for the winding to do is to be able to handle whatever current we're going to pull through it at whatever setting we're operating at. So what are these, what are, why were these, why do we have these in shops, in electronic oh, shops? Like what, what are they traditionally pre, used for? They kind of preceded regulators where okay. you needed to set a voltage for a particular reason. You needed to compensate for varying line voltage you needed to have a, a, a specific voltage that you want to test something at that makes sense uh, in repairs if you've got something that's drawing a lot of current you want to bring up the voltage slowly to see if it's drawing current before it starts smoking whatever is damaged mm. inside the, the unit under test under repair uh, and uh, are those other Variax up there. Uh, the right. Well, we use we use uh, we use Variax all over the place. Okay. Um, regulators are really expensive. They're huge, and uh, we could use them to regulate the the test voltage here, but it's kind of overkill. And sometimes we want to vary the voltage. Okay. We want to. You've uh, done that on some of these videos. We yeah we yeah. we basically test things at a voltage, and we monitor the line voltage here. Uh huh coming into the work area. We sure. monitor the line voltage. There. And then we compensate it oh, look, accordingly over, over here. Got it. So generally I like to test everything in a, between 118 and 120 volts. Okay. And on any, at any given time of day, the voltage here will vary between 115 and 125 because we're in an industrial area. Got it. When all the heaters and air conditioning and welding machines down the street or whatever, are all going just to pull and pull and pull and yeah. So when we compensate for all that, and later on everybody turns off their stuff, the voltage goes like, back whoa. up. So, um, but there are times when we want the voltage to drag down when something is under load, and we want to be able to watch that. A regulator won't allow us to do that. A regulator will keep everything locked and sure. won't tell us what we want to know about voltage drop. Sure. So, uh, when I was a uh, kid and I had my first high watt that was turned out to be too loud my second high watt actually my first one was a 50 the second one was a hundred and it was too loud I discovered that by setting the voltage from 120 to 240 volts made the amp distort really nicely I thought that sounded great when I got that to a gig I didn't have any volume it didn't cut through the band at all I'm mm -hmm. oh, okay that's not gonna work there has to be some thing in between so this is this was in the early 70s and I went, "Oh, okay. So now I understand the concept of having the voltage low, but that's too low." Mhm. Mm so I need to get it somewhere in between where it's supposed to be and where I need it to be. Yes. And uh I ran across a, a Variac in a surplus store and I bought that. Had you heard of them? I no, they nobody talked about them then. Wow. I hadn't heard about it. I just thought, "Okay, well from that experiment there's got to be something There's out gotta there. There's got to be something out there. And I went to this surplus electronic store. It was just a junk store down mm -hmm. on, in Skid Row in Seattle. This guy had all this ancient old stuff. 
and I was telling him about my experiments. He goes, well, you need a Variac. Yeah. And he shows me, he drags it out of the dust and the cobwebs, and I dutifully hauled it home. That's a like, total oh. movie scene. Yeah. Oh. I played around with that for a while and decided that really wasn't the solution to the problem that I was trying to solve, but I did learn from that. So it was interesting later on when uh, the people started talking about Eddie's using a Variac, and I went, oh, okay, well, that's... Nothing new, but apparently it was new to a lot of people. Sure. So, um, and most Variacs actually have put out a little bit more voltage than when you put into them. So I've got 118 going in, and I've got the output of their Variac set onto this voltmeter here, and it's putting out 128. They generally, oh, that's interesting. They generally run up to about 130 from zero. Okay. So that you have a little bit more than line voltage to play with if you need it. So here's 120 here. Yep. On the scale, it's reading 117 there. And I taped this off a long time ago. And if you look, there's a line there that represents 120. 120. This one says 117, I think, or 115. I can't tell, but that's below. There's 110 down there. About 110 below the 110 mark. Yeah. And we got 100 marked off at about <clears throat> 95 as opposed to 100 so that's how that's interesting uh, and they're this all this is crude as you well, said well they're all crude they're yeah. all with going to be plus or minus 20 percent tolerance so the numbers on the scale are just for relative reference only they don't tell you exactly and that's the way you monitor everything sure sure so um what we're going to do today is uh use this on a couple of different amps and talk about why they work on certain amps and why they might not be suitable to work on other amps. Perfect. Yep. Okay, so we have a Deliverance 120 set up, the Series 2, the new one, um, that we're going to use uh, for this initial experiment. We're going to talk a little bit about current draw. We started to talk about it at the intro. Uh, on a Variac, they're rated in VA, volt amps. VA is basically an equation, volts times amp which is watts, but they're, they're, they're usually stated in terms of how much current they can pass through them to whatever you're plugging it into, or watts or VA, most of them use VA. So you'll see any one of those ratings on the front of any of these variacs. It's really easy to convert power to, power to current to voltage using Ohm's law. So um, generally, with a 100 watt amp, you're going to see the rating on the back of the amp, how much power it actually draws, 350 watts. And that's 350 watts at 120 volts input or, or thereabouts. So what you do is you, you divide the power div by the uh, voltage and you get the, how much current draw and that's what the fuse rating is basically. So. All you need to do when you're using a Variac with an amplifier is make sure that you have enough power capability out of the Variac to drive the amp without overheating the Variac. So they usually come in ratings of 100 watts, 250 watts, 500 watts, and 1,000 watts. So generally for a 100 watt amp, you're going to use a 1,000 watt attenuator. Uh, and so you have a... a so, some margin of error, some additional clue. You don't want to max it out. Makes sense. And the reason is because, like I said before, they're just coils of wire. And when those wires get hot, when those coils get overheated, the voltage will drop. So they'll lose efficiency and the voltage, the sound of the amp will start to sag. And we don't want that. And we also don't want the thing to get hot enough to either burn you or set anything nearby on fire. So for an amp like this, that draws maximum 350 watts, which is the same as a 100 watt Marshall usually draws, uh, you're gonna want at least a 700 watt attenuator. And since they come in these sort of standardized 500 watt, one kilowatt ranges, you'll just get a just jump to a grand. The price difference between the two is, is negligible. So um, what we're gonna do now is we're just gonna run a signal into the amplifier and look at the sine wave on the scope at maximum power output, which is 100. 100 plus watts and we're going to watch the uh, very act that we're using i'm bypassing the whole preamp stage we're going into the effects return so we're just watching what the power amp is doing we're using the bench very act not the previous one uh that i was demonstrating because it's already all set up and monitored here so we're monitoring at 119 volts 
uh, right now. And that's what's powering the amp. And now we run up the signal into the effects return until the amplifier is putting out full power at clipping. We know we're at clipping because we're seeing the ripple in the power supply. And that's, we're maxed out on the power supply now. And you see on the meter, we're at 28 volts. 28 volts um, uh, works out to 100 watts of RMS of power output. Uh, we could get a little more by making sure that we're 120 volts, but as you can see, we dropped down two volts on the Variac. Um, that's the loss that's being induced by the Variac, and we can compensate for that by just turning the Variac back up to 120 volts, and then you can see that the power output, we can squeeze it up to, to 30, which is about 120 watts uh, at clipping. So um, that's why we have a Variac up here, so we can fine tune and check exactly how things are working. Now, uh, with regard to using a Variac on an amplifier to get it to behave a certain way, the question is, well, can you, what amplifiers can you use a Variac on? I've heard that modern amps, you can't use it, and on vintage amps, you can, and why is that? Generally, modern amps will have some kind of regulation circuit in it, Mm. And that's the problem with using a Variac in that a regulator operates by receiving a variable input voltage and outputting a static voltage, sure. a fixed voltage. And how a, how a regulator does that is you purposely put too much voltage into the circuit and then it stops the voltage from going past a certain threshold. And then as the voltage drops down, you're still over the threshold. And as long as you're a few volts over the threshold, it will keep regulating. The point at which you drop below the regulator circuit's ability to regulate, it'll stop regulating. Not only will it stop regulating, but it will stop filtering the hum out of the voltage and a hum will develop. Now you're not damaging anything by doing that. So the myth that you can't use a Variac with a modern amp because it will blow it up is not true. It just won't function properly. Once you restore the voltage to the operating voltage, it'll operate properly and the regulator will start regulating properly again. Most well-designed regulator circuits are designed with the understanding that there's going to be a wide range of variation in the line voltage coming in. And an, an engineer will design a regulator circuit to uh, operate properly within the low line, high line constraints. Low line meaning the lowest possible voltage you'll accept. High line meaning the highest possible input voltage you'll accept. So on an amplifier like this, low line would be about 105 volts. High line would be about 135. So within that range, the regulator will stay locked on at all times. Below 100, you might drop out of the regulator circuit. Now the deliverance has DC on the filaments of the preamp stages to keep the noise down because it's a high gain amp. And with a really high gain amp, if you've got AC uh, filament voltage on the first stage, that AC will introduce hum because the tube is operating at such a high gain that it will amplify the hum along with the signal mm. that you're putting into it. Okay. So that's why you want regulators uh, or at least a DC voltage on the filaments. Having a regulator on the DC filaments is better in my estimation because it maintains the, the 12AX7 at its optimum operating voltage and current at all times regardless of what the line voltage is doing. Uh, somebody might argue that, well, that takes away the amp's ability to sag. Yes and no, because only the first two most sensitive preamp stages in the amp are on that regulator. The rest of them are all AC heaters because they don't, they don't, uh, we're not concerned that they're going to pick up any noise because they're farther down the stream. So they're going to be more, uh, they're going to be more resistant to noise, uh, coming in from the AC filament line. So those tubes and all the power tubes and the phase inverter tube can all sag when you're cranking the amp and when, or if the line voltage is sagging. So you don't really lose the, the, the dynamic quality and the sag quality of the amplifier just by having one or two stages 
uh, on DC filaments. Now, um, we have the regulator here that has um, 18 volts on its input. Now, what what is the regulator in here physically? It's a well, it's a it's a regulator IC. It's a IC. it's a it's a it's a standard. Uh, it's a standard regulator component. It actually is an IC that does all the regulation and sensing in one single part. So you don't have to build out a discrete, got it, sophisticated uh, regulator circuit. It's all in there. All it has to do is uh, do its job. So at 120 line volts, 118, I think is where we're at. Uh, we've got 18 volts going into the regulator, mm -hmm. and we've got 12 and a half coming out. Uh, why 12 and a half and not 12? Because the preamp tubes uh, with the filaments in series operate at 12.6 volts. So we're kind of within that that middle of the tolerance range of the preamp tube wanting to be at 12 and a, 12, roughly 12 and a half. So that's where that is. Now, when we variac the amp, and by variac, I mean, when we turn the line voltage down using a variac to get the amp to sag more, and we'll see that up here since we've got the amp cranked up pretty good. When we variac the amp down, you'll see the power go down and the clipping go up. And you also see here the voltage going to input of the regulator is going down. So now we're three volts down from where it was, and yet the output is still at 12 and a half, and it will stay there for a while. How much of a while? Let's find out. We're at 100 volts right now. Uh, for people wanting to do the Eddy experiment, he always ran, according to every, those in the know, he always ran his variac at 90 volts. Can you run this amp to 90 volts? Well, we're at 100 right now, and we're at 12 volts output of the regulator, and we're at 15 and a half on the input. We want to have no more than three volts difference between the it input and the output or the regulator starts to drop out and we'll see that. So we're at 100. Let's go down to 95. And we're starting to see the regulator output drop a little bit and we are at 90. We're at 14 volts and we want to be at a minimum of 15 before the regulator actually starts to drop out. So let's go down to 90 now. Just keep pumping it down. Now we're at 90 and now you see we've really, we've lost a volt on the filament regulator. And the input is now 13. So it's still trying to regulate because we're at 13 on the end. If it wasn't regulating at all, it would be 10 on the output. So it's still trying to regulate a little bit. Uh, and you see that the power amp is really clipping and we're down to 21 and a half volts. 20 volts at eight ohms is 50 watts. So we're at about half the output power that the amplifier is capable of uh, right now by variacting down to 90. So let's take the signal out and put a speaker on it so we can hear what's going on. I'm going on the speaker output now. And you can hear that there's sound coming out of that speaker. And we turn up the massive volume. We have the gains kind of turned up. Then you hear a buzz coming out of there. Yep. Now, we went up to 97. And it disappeared. And it disappeared. Now the regulator is fully regulating again. So. 95, it, it does introduces not like 95, again. It does 95, it wants 97. Now we could design the regulator so that it would have a wider uh, operating range for low line um, so that you could variac it all the way down to 90 if you wanted to 
the problem is, is then when you're operating at its normal voltage, it could get a little too hot if the line voltage runs high. Mm. It could get hot enough, it's got a self protection circuit inside that if it gets past a certain temperature, it'll just turn itself off so it can cool off. So we don't want that. So this is why the regulator has to be carefully designed to operate within the net amplifier's normal operating parameters. 98% of the people that play this amp are not gonna be running it on a Variac. Right. So we're designing for those people. The guy that wants to try it on a Variac, you can do it. You can run it down to 90, as long as you can put up with that. If you can't put up with that, you can just run it down to the point just before it starts to become a problem sonically and it'll still operate properly and i'll show you what i mean by that we're back to having uh let's see we're at the point where um we're at 97 volts before the regulator dropped out right and we're at about 55 watts roughly mm -hmm. we have nice power amp saturation there and uh, if we wanted to variac this all the time i would say i would i would run the variac at 100 volts just call it 100 and then i would go back in and bias the tubes so that they are so we get rid of the crossover distortion at that setting and the time that we had uh freeman's 50 oh, watt good in there too huh the time we had Friedman's 50 watt Marshall in here and, and we were showing how that operated crank down with the Variac. We also recall that we had the amp biased for full, um, for full idle current at the 90 volt setting. That would be, the tube would overheat if you ran it at 120 volts at that bias setting. But he's not running it that way. So he's always keeping the Variac on there that would be a correct bias setting. For this, the correct bias setting is how it would behave at 118 volts, which is up here. So if we wanted to crank it down to 98 and get rid of the crossover distortion, we can do that just by readjusting the bias for that level of operation. Why would we want to do that? Okay. What you're doing when you're using a Variac on an amp is you're turning down all the operating voltages so that the power stage will start to clip sooner. Why don't we just put the amp on an attenuator and clip the crap out of it? We can. What that will do is cause the output transformer to saturate more and induce more of that sort of mid-range bark that output transformers impart on the sound when they begin to saturate. They get more mid-range heavy because when they're saturating, the high frequency and low frequencies roll off. So you get more of a bark in the mids mm. by doing that. Okay. The reverse smile EQ. Why didn't Ed do that? He probably did it because attenuators of the day sounded like shit. Right. And uh, there's other things going on, and we'll get into that shortly. But um, the lack of credible attenuators at the time would be a reason not to do that. The other reason is, if you variac the thing down so that you're getting saturation, you're not hitting the output transformer hard enough to get it to saturate. So now the output transformer is cleaner. It's got a better bottom end and a better top end. Okay, so what is, where's the overdrive saturation coming from? It's coming from the phase inverter mostly, because oh. now the phase inverter can't drive the tubes as hard because it hasn't got enough voltage. So. It's not pushing the tubes in more in distortion because the phase inverter actually can't do its job of pushing the output tubes to full output. So you can't call it power tube distortion. You can only call it power tube distortion in that there's distortion coming out of, from the power tubes, but they're not generating it. The phase inverter is generating it. So that's what gives it that sort of characteristic bouncy squish. That's coming from the phase inverter. And you can experience a similar kind of phase inverter distortion by using a uh, post phase inverter master volume. Because what that does is turns the signal down after the phase inverter going to the power tube so that you can jam more signal into the phase inverter. And as anybody who's done that knows, it sounds kind of pillowy and squishy and some people like that sponginess. Uh, that's a way to do it. It's in a similar way, you're getting everything else up to the phase inverter going like crazy, but the power amp isn't 
itself, the power tubes and the output transformer, aren't really working very hard. So they're actually op adding a little bit of a clean characteristic on top of all this saturation. They still preserve so, um, like the cleanliness and it can punch and do everything that right, right. you want it so, to do. So between an attenuator or running the amp wide open with a master volume or using a, 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 a variac, what you're doing is you're deciding what percentage of distortion you want from the amplifier at what part of the amplifier you're getting it from. That's the front crazy. end, the middle, <clears throat> or the output stage, or a combination of all of those. Now you're gonna get the best combination of all of those using an attenuator uh, because then you're gonna be able to set, ideally, you're gonna be able to set the amp at what you call the sweet spot, and that sweet spot is gonna be different for every player. Uh, and then, you'll set the attenuator to the volume that you want to be playing at while you've got your amp set to what you consider your ideal sweet spot. Uh, and the only problem with that is you have to have an attenuator that's got fine of an, enough of adjustment to get you at the volume you want to be at while the amplifier is getting the sound you want to hear from it or you want it to respond to when you're playing. So those are all these things. They're just balancing acts of different ways of getting the amps to misbehave the way we want them to. Uh, so again, it, it's not really important which specific attenuator somebody used in the past to get that. They're all basically the same. A coil of wire around an insulator with a selecting tap, picking, uh, picking a tap somewhere on the auto transformer's range to give you the voltage that you want and uh, at a reliable temperature rating and all of that. So there's so, no magic there's no vintage magic variac. Here, you know, there's like, yeah. oh, let's get... This is uh, the one Ed used. Yeah, let's get an attenuator with uh, pure silver wine. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's not going to be like that. You're not going to find one anywhere. You're going to custom build it. Uh, and for all the effort and expense that you're going to go through to do that, you're going to probably end up in the same place anyway. They're just they're just too far down the stream to really matter to the tone. They only matter insofar as they're putting the voltage where it should be, below where it should be, or as Eddie famously said way back in the <laughs> early days, yeah, I run it up to 130, and uh, he didn't do that, but the people that did blew their amps. So. Right. That's why or why not you would use an attenuator on a modern amp. Now, a more sophisticated modern amp that has more stages, more features and functions, more regulators, that's gonna complicate the stew because then you may have two or three regulated circuits that you have to worry about, are they gonna drop out or not? So again, it's not gonna hurt the amp if you drop out a regulator, you'll be able to hear it on the speaker. It won't damage it. It isn't anything that isn't recoverable from. It's just you're going to find that the more sophisticated and and uh, and feature intense the amp is, the more likely it's going to you're going to have difficulty dealing with the variac. But if you've got a multi-featured, multi-function amp like that anyway, you're probably not the kind of player that is interested in a variac. The, the the thing of the, the reason I'm using the deliverance as an example is because it kind of straddles those two those two worlds the, the kind of player that likes things simple and straight ahead that might consider using a, a, a attenuator or an attenuator or a variac um, let's see some examples of modern amps in recent history that uh, recognize the importance of the variac function Bogner had a switch called a variac switch, which is basically a tap on the input side of the amplifier that set the set the power transformer so that it operate at a lower voltage. Uh, the Mesa rectifier, same thing. The uh, the tweed mode or the vintage mode, they had a switch and it did the same thing. Just operated the transformer at a lower voltage. The problem with that is it turns down the heater voltages. Uh, I did one in the past where the heater voltages and all the other voltages stayed pretty much locked where they're supposed to and the only thing that changed was the supply voltage to the tubes, the power supply voltage, the plate voltage to the tubes. Uh, that has its own kind of a personality. And then there's, uh, uh, then there's the, um, there's the, uh, I forget the name of it, uh, there's a regulator circuit that you can buy as a kit that you can put in an amp 
the name will come to me in a minute, but you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, that you can vary, it's a variable high voltage regulator, so you can vary the voltage going to the two plates, uh, and you can select whether you want only the power tubes, the power tubes and the phase inverter, or the power tubes, the phase inverter, and the preamp tubes to all be affected by this varying voltage. Um, and there's advantages and disadvantages to that. One of the disadvantages, the big disadvantages, is that because it's on a regulator, even though you set it lower, it's still on a regulator, so it stays fixed where you set it. So it won't sag, it won't respond dynamically to your playing. And even though it's a cool idea, you just get more power tube distortion or power tube induced distortion by dint of the voltage being lower, but you don't get a, a dynamic feel. You don't get a touch sensitive kickback response from the amplifier with a circuit like that. And that's, it, it, they tend to sound kind of sterile because of that. And that's the drawback of those circuits. I think that pretty much covers all the, all the sort of clandestine ways that you can, you can make an amp do something other than it was originally designed to do. So we're gonna go, but go down and um, get an amp out of the cobwebs and set it up with a variac in a couple of interesting ways where we can drop it all down, all the way down to 90 volts because it doesn't have any regulation in it. All right? Surprise, surprise. Okay, here we have a bone stock, 100% original 1971 JMP uh, Nineteen fifty-nine, and uh, it's a beauty. We have got it um, up on the bench at one hundred and nineteen volts on the AC input, and we're just running a signal directly into the power amp to check the power amp performance and the bias. It's biased for no crossover distortion, so it's going to be loud and proud and clean. Right. It's going to take some serious volume to get it to overdrive, and it's going to be painful. So we're not going to really do that right now. We're just going to show that when we bring the signal up on the scope, this is about 100 watts right here. Look at that. It's not even clipping, right? It's Am not even remotely right? clipping. Now, we're actually getting past the range of my scope to see wow. the ripple. Um... Wow. But the way we know that we're achieving maximum power output of the power supply in this thing is we start to see the crossover distortion get introduced into it there. Yeah. So the other way to do it is I can just change the position of that, uh, not that one, of the signal that the scope is seeing. So we just change the position so that we can see the top of the waveform. And right there, oh, there's the ripple. We could go the other direction see and the bottom. see it on the bottom. Okay. That's where the clipping is, right at the point where the ripple is being introduced. And at that point, we're at 30 volts. So, using Ohm's Law, and I'm running it at 8 ohms into the load here because that's my standard load. So, um, doing the standard calculation of squaring the output into 8 ohms. Uh, we get 113 watts. Can actually get it. We can actually push it a little bit more into clipping and get it up to 130. So we're just we're just touching the power supply now. We funny? get up. We can get it up to 32. At 32 volts, we're at 130 watts, and it's still going to be unbearably clean because you're not going to be able to stand it unless you're attenuating it. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, that's that. So, now, what happens, let's run it back up to our 32 volts, which is 130 watts. Right there. We've got a little bit of loss through the Variac, which is operating right now, and it was, it was set to 119, and we're down about a little, little less than two volts, a little more than two volts. Now we variac it down to where we at we were at with the deliverance to at 98, and and that's right before the relays were starting to give up the ghost a little bit. That's Not the right. relays, the, the regulators. Right, right. 
So um, we're getting a lot more. Um, we're getting a lot more ripple in the power supply because of the design of the power supply and the fact that the the current is being drawn is pretty big. So we're getting more ripple there. However, because we don't have regulators involved, we can turn it down further without having the regulators drop out and induce more hum. So you can see we're getting 25 volts out of it set that way, whereas with the deliverance we were getting more like 22. So very similar performance except you're not going to hear the regulator dropout noise. However, what you are going to hear is probably more power supply noise because it's a noisy power supply and the no and in this in this particular amp it, they're known for being kind of obnoxious in the ground department. So at 90 volts here when we're very acting this amp by turning it down to nine, we're trying to get everything to saturate. By doing that, we need to turn the volumes way up. By doing that, we really start to expose how much hum there is built into the power supply that the deliverance doesn't have because the deliverance has a power supply that's filtered better than this. So you're still gonna hear some hum, no matter whether it's regulators dropping out or power supply ripple bleeding into the signal stages. <laughs> there isn't anything getting around that. Pick so, your poison. Pick your poison. So, um... In, in cellular noise pollution. Yeah, and so uh, when we when we do the show, we'll play through these so you can hear how they sound. But this is what we've got when we're cranking things to try to get... Uh, to try to get saturation. So it's, you're gonna deal with noise one way or the other in one way. Rock and roll is noisy. So, but now what we're gonna do is we're gonna experiment with the power tubes. And, uh, and we're actually gonna remove two. So that, we're gonna get set up and show you that. All right, what are we doing here, Mr. Steve? This amp arrived with Electroharmonic EL34s. Okay. Which are pretty nice tubes. They're not quite as nice as the Mullers, but they're perfectly good. And in this amp. And when, when you talk about them nice, how do we qualify yeah, nice? Yeah, I'm being a little vague there. I mean, I like the bottle shape of the Mullers better. I like the <laughs> logo better. Um, they last longer? What are their. their um, oh, they last their general... about the same. They just, yeah. you know, they're just. They, they look a little trickier. I th actually, I think that the Mullards sound more like Mullards than these. These these are a little, I don't know, not maybe not as robust in the low end, but it's okay. subtle. All right, all right. So now what we're going to do, uh, Eddie was known to put six CA7s in uh, his Marshalls. <laughs> oh, and, he had these. Uh, well, they're from the 70s. Wow. Uh, there's a date code on there. They might be 80s. Uh, I don't have the the date code. Uh, I don't remember how to read the date code, but it's these dots here. You see it says 60A7 USA, and below it there's a series of dots that looks mm -hmm. like Braille. Yep. That's the date code. Oh, okay. I, ju I Just off the top of my head, I don't know how to read that. So uh, someone who's watching this... Uh can figure it out. Figure it out and put it in the comments, please. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you can A little Easter egg there. You can Google that. Easter egg hunt, rather. Okay, these are genuine GE 6CA7s. What's a 6CA7? It says right on there, 6CA7 slash EL34. Uh, this was GE's way of getting around the Mullard EL34 patent. They made... <laughs> They, Sneaky. They made them slightly differently so that they could get around the patent and they... Do you know what was different about them? Uh, yeah, but it's pretty deep and we, I don't want to get into it right now. Okay. But it has to do with the, uh, the beam warming plates and how the, how the suppressor grid is structured. Okay. They have the same basic specs, operate at the same basic impedance, have very similar characteristics, but they do sound distinctly different. They, they have more of a 606 sort of quality to them. 
so they're clearer. That is very, very interesting if that's what Ed was using, and then he wound up moving over to using 6L6s later on. Right. That's exactly right. And that's, that's probably why 6L6s got used in the, in the 5150. Yeah. Um, now, somebody will say, oh, well, Ed uses the, the Sylvania 6L6s, not the uh, 6CA7s, not the GEs. Well, here's a... Here's a Sylvania. And here's a GE. They're very similar. Very, very similar. And they're very similar in operation, too. The main, comp the main thing that makes these different than the EL34 is the, uh, the beam-forming plates construction that they both use that EL34s do not use. So behavior-wise, they're almost identical. And um, I believe this GE one came out first, and then Sylvania followed suit, and then Sylvania was purchased by Philips, and they, so they became Philips, but they're the same tube. Uh, in the late 80s, the Sylvania 6CA7s had a problem with mechanical rattling. You could hear them rattle and click around in there. And so they started to develop a bad reputation. But by this time, GE had already stopped making 6CA7. So they were actually buying EL34s from East Germany and branding them GE. RCA was doing the same thing. So uh, the whole concept of which tube is which and how do they behave got really blurred by the actions of these different companies that were gradually phasing out their production anyway. So what we're going to do is we're going to put two of those in here and then we're going to bias it so that they're operating in, uh, so that they're not operating with too much crossover distortion. We're going to check that out right now. And, and then we're going to show how it behaves once it's very acted down. We're going to run it back up to its R119. We're going to inject our signal at the same point directly into the power amp. It's just great that this is completely stock and original. And Which, by the way, it has it has the uh, the the broader uh, mid range slope. The this, touring circuit. It's accomplished by the thirty three k and four seventy pico capacitor. Other amplifiers of this era had the fifty six k and two twenty pico capacitor, which made it sound just as sparkly on top, but sort of opened up the mid range a little bit. And this one has is a little bit more mid range forward because of that. Everything else is bone stock. So now, let's look at, I wanna know what the bias voltage was set at in the first place. So let's look at that. I didn't bother to pay attention to it at the time. We're at minus 44, typically. 35 to 45 on average. Uh, and now we're going to far it up and I've got the signal blasting through it already. So now you can see we're clipping way, way lower because we're only running two power tubes. Right. We're, we're seeing 16 volts output. Uh, 16 volts gives us six times six divided by eight is 32 watts. So this is what we can expect to see on a good day. Now, um, not only are we not going to do much better than that, it's going to get even lower once we vary act it. So the first thing I do is I'm just going to bump the bias up a little bit because we can run them hotter now that there's only two of them. And so we're just going to do that. And what we see is we're getting clipping on one side more than the other side. Why? Let's have a look. We may have... Is that asymmetrical clipping? It is. And it could be attributed to one of the power tubes being weaker than the other. Because mm. we weren't seeing that before. Yeah, we may have one power tube. One of those, yeah. One of those power tubes 
is not in that great a condition. There we back. There we're back to being symmetrical. And what did you do? How did that happen? Huh? How did you get it to be symmetrical? Uh, it decided to be symmetrical again. Oh, but, interesting. Yeah, one of the power tubes is being a little glitchy. Let's see. Hmm. Is, it, is it you? Is it you? Yeah, it's this guy. The ghost in the machine. That could be the tube itself, or it could just be a little bit of contact oxidation. Unless it demands to be replaced, we're going to just run with it. Okay. Because we're already warmed up with them. Yeah, and now it's symmetrical again. So. It's symmetrical, and we're up to 17 volts. So... 17 times 17 divided by 8 is 36. So we've gained a few more, a few more watts. So now... What are those called? Watts? Watts. So now we're going to run it up to full power again. And now we're going to drop the variac voltage to 90. Look at that. Smash. Yeah, total smash. Now, very act down like this, like we did on Dave's end, we might, we're gonna to want to jack the bias down so that they draw more current. Yeah. But before we do that, we're gonna set it at the normal voltage. And we're gonna play through it at the normal voltage and the normal bias setting into a cab. So now we have we have this set up with two six CA7s at the normal bias for the normal line voltage of 118, 120, give or take. And we're running into its matching red basket V412 greenback cabinet. And that's who. Now that sounds pretty insane just by itself without being very act down just running at a half power with the 60a7s they give us this nice crisp top end the particular tone control slope that's in there give us a, gives us a great mid-range bark and the low end is nice and tight uh it's humming like crazy because that's what they did sure when you crank them all but away. man is that a nice wallet oh yeah just totally nice so now um now we're going to reset it so that we're running it at 90 volts on the Variac and we're gonna adjust the bias to run it that way. And then we're gonna play it again. Okay, we've got the bias reset. We basically have it maxed. Um, bias is maxed. We have the, um, and well, let's see what that actually means. Okay. <laughs> so we've got negative 30 volts. Uh, with four power tubes and the normal line voltage, we would be at 45 volts. So with the bias max, the most negative voltage we can get to the tubes is 30. And that puts it right where we want it to be for the crossover distortion, which is, which is not there at clipping. It doesn't really seep in until we're really cramming on it. Yeah. And that's just the way they normally behave. Once you have the bias set correctly, if you really oversaturate the power amp, you get crossover distortion. That's just the way it is. So, mm -hmm. but at clipping, we don't have any. Uh, so we're at 90 volts in. We're getting 12 volts output, and 12 volts. Uh, I did say 12. Um, translates to 18 watts. So the most we can get out of this setup like this is 18 watts. <laughs> so this is a 100 watt amp with two six CA sevens, bias to the max running at 90 volts AC on the input. Gives us this.
right hand sweep, 90 volts AC in, uh, biased max so that the power tubes aren't uh, crossing over too badly at this lower plate voltage and uh, uh, we're not doing any serious life threatening stuff to the cabinet because it's only seeing 18 watts. So that, I'd say that, that you'll notice that it sounds more saturated and more harmonic saturation stuff coming out. About the same amount of hum as we were getting when it was cranked the other way. Um, and not quite as much punch. But then if you use a pickup that's got a little bit more output, you would get a, a, a thicker sound. So um, that's... But that's these are basically PAF. These are, yeah, these are sort of, sort of PAF kind of, kind of pickups. Okay, so what we have is the EL34s that came with it, the electroharmonics EL34s biased properly for the normal line voltage that the amp operates at and where the tubes want to see it at clipping. We're not over biasing it, we're not under biasing it, we're not biasing them hot or cold, we're putting them right on the line. And what we're doing is we're running into a power station, 100, and then into this uh, red, uh, matching greenback cab that goes with this amp. It's a 1971. And uh, I have a pretty much a full right hand sleep on just the hot. And uh, okay, so we got it cranked out into the power station at a relatively moderate volume. <laughs> What I was doing there was I was inducing the ghost notes. And the one thing that you can really get out of an amp like this set to a right hand sweep into an attenuator that you can't do as well 
very acting, very acting that you can't do as well, very acting it down, is induce the ghost notes because that's a power supply function. Mm. The power supply has to be under full load in order to accomplish that. Mm. And if you very act everything down, you're running the amp at 18 watts, you're not putting any load on the power supply, you're not saturating the output transformer, so you're not going to get that ghost note activity. That's the thing that I live for. So to me, this is the best sounding combination of the three that we tried because you can hear the ghost note thing. You can hear that third harmonic go down when the dyad bending the strings went up. You can hear it clearly and distinctly. It's actually a piece of the music that you can manipulate. You don't get that with the Variac. And uh, the other thing is, is when you turn the guitar volume down and play lightly, you really hear the clarity and the articulation that's a personality of the amp because you're not pushing it hard enough to break up. So you've got just enough gain going into the amp so that it can amplify it without getting into too much distortion territory and it sounds really clean just on the edge breakup. But if you back down the guitar volume a little more, it even cleans up a little more. And so that just gives you all this range on the guitar that you don't have with any other pulling tubes, very acting down, any of that kind of stuff. Uh, master volume, post-phase inverter master volume, none of those other solutions will accomplish what this stock amp crank will accomplish into attenuation so that you can really experience those those subtle behaviors and the ghost notes and all that without going deaf. And that's really the best advantage of it all. All right, all right, enough noise. Okay, so what basically what we did was just figure out how to, how to hack an amp to get it to behave the way you want it to and the different kinds of hacks and their and their their drawbacks and their advantages to me uh this particular amp set up with 60a7s and very act down it almost starts to sound a little squawky and fizzy to me and i would want a little bit more of a robust sound but there's no denying that this has got a really signature kind of a bark that is really familiar sounding. And uh, that's just a demonstration of the different ways that you can use this to get it to behave the way you want it to use. Same with, with any other amp. Same with monitor, mo modern amp. Same with any other amp. Same with modern amps. Uh, it's just that you now you want to understand sort of the range of options that you have in using these different tools to get the amp to behave these different ways. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba. Really? <laughs>